interpretation of remedial and penal statutes distinction between remedial and penal statutes every modern legislation is purported with some policy and broadly speaking has some beneficial object behind it there are legislations which are intended to cure some immediate mischief and bring into effect some type of social reforms by ameliorating the conditions of certain class of persons who according to the present day notions may not have been fairly treated in the past such legislations prohibit certain acts by declaring them invalid and provide for redress of or compensation to the person aggrieved if a statute of this nature does not make the offender liable to any penalty in favor of the state the legislation is remedial remedial statutes are known as welfare beneficent or social justice oriented legislations penal statutes are those which provide for penalties for disobedience of the law and are directed against the offender in relation to the state by making him liable to imprisonment fine forfeiture or other penalty if the statute enforces obedience to the command of the law and by punishing the offender and not by merely redressing on individual who may have suffered is classified as penal remedial statute is to be interpreted liberally whereas a penal statute is strictly construed that is in resolving a doubt which other canons of construction fail to solve when two or more constructions are equally open in case of remedial statute the doubt is solved in favor of the class of person for whose benefit the statute is enacted whereas in case of penal statute the doubt is resolved in favor of the alleged offender liberal construction of remedial statute in constructing a remedial statute the court ought to give to it the widest operation which its language will permit the court has to see that the particular case is within the mischief to be remedied and falls within the language of the enactment the words of a remedial statute must be so construed as to give the most complete remedy with the phraseology will permit so as to secure that relief contemplated by the statute shall not be denied to the class intended to be re- relieved the court ought to be more concerned with the content and the context of the statute rather than with the, uh, with its literal imports the court has to give due regard to the directive principles of the state policy and any international conventions on the subject and teleological approach and social perspective must play upon the interpretive process in case of a social benefit oriented le- legislation like the consumer protection act of 1986 the provision of the act how to be construed in favor of the consumer to achieve the purpose of the enactment but without doing violence to the language the rule as stated and explained above only means that if a section in a remedial statute is reasonably capable of two constructions that construction should be preferred which furthers the policy of the act and is more beneficial to those in whose interest the act may have been passed the doubt if any should be resolved in favor of those in whose interest that 
have been passed. So, in case of an exception which curtails the operation of the beneficial legislation, in case of doubt, the court would construe it narrowly so as to not, not to unduly expand the area of scope of exception. But the liberal construction must flow from the language used and the rule does not permit placing of an unnatural interpretation on the words contained in the enactment, nor does it permit the raising of any presumption that protection of widest amplitude must be conferred upon those for whose benefit the legislation may have, may have been enacted. Further, the rule does not apply against the plain meaning rule and has no application when two constructions are not fairly open and the words of the enactment are reasonably capable of only one construction. Dayalala versus Rasul Muhammad, AR 1964 Supreme Court decision. A tenant inducted by a mortgage was held to be a deemed tenant under Section 4 of the Bombay Tenancy and Agriculture Land Act, which conferred that status on a person lawfully cultivating any land belonging to another person and if such a person is not a mortgagee in possession and was held to be protected even after the redemption of mortgage. Central Railway Workshop Jansi versus Vishnath, AR 1970 Supreme Court decision. The question was whether timekeepers who prepare the pay sheet of the work, uh, workshop staff and maintain leave accounts were workers as defined in the Factories Act 1948. The definition of worker in the Act is a person employed directly or through an agency, whether for wages or not, in any manufacturing process or any other kind of work which is incidental to or connected with the manufacturing process. By giving liberal construction to the definition, timekeepers and accountants were held as workers is as being employed in a kind of work incidental to the manufacturing process. B. Shah versus presiding officer, Labor Court, AR 1978, Supreme Court, page number 12. The court applied the beneficent rule of construction in construing section 5 of the Maternity Benefit Act 1961, which makes the employer liable for the payment of maternity benefit to a woman worker at the rate of the average daily wage for the period of actual absence for six weeks immediately preceding and including the day of her delivery and for the six week immediately following that day. The question was whether in calculating the maternity benefit for the period covered by Section 5, Sundays being wageless holidays, should be excluded. In holding that, Sundays must be included. The court observed that the benefit conferred by the Act is to be read in the light of Article 42 of the Constitution and was intended to enable the women worker not only to subsist, but also to make up her dissipated energy, nurse her child, preserve her efficiency as a worker and to maintain the level of previous efficiency and output. Bhagirath versus Delhi Administration, AR 1985 Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held that the beneficent provisions of Section 428 of CRPC 
directing set off the period of pre-conviction detention against the term of imprisonment is applicable even to cases where the sentence is imprisonment for life and that such a sentence is also imprisonment for a term within the section. In holding so, the Supreme Court observed that the denial of the benefit of section 428 to those sentenced to life imprisonment is to withdraw the application of the benevolent provision from the large majority of cases in which such a benefit would be needed and justified. MP Mineral Industry Association versus Regional Labor Commissioner, AR 1960, Supreme Court. While dealing with the Schedule to the Minimum Wages Act 1948, which reads, Employment in stone breaking or stone crushing, the Supreme Court held that the entry was confined to stone breaking or stone crushing employment in stone quarries and that it did not include the breaking or crushing of stones incidental to mining operations. The plea of an extended meaning of the entry based on the rule of liberal construction rejected as in view of the court the alternative construction was not reasonably open.